Welcome to Bridging Gaps, the business podcast sharing the challenges and stories of fellow business owners. Hello, I'm your host, Deborah Levitt. In this week's episode, I'm in conversation with nine, yes, nine business owners. As yesterday was Small Business Saturday, I decided it was a great time to share the mini interviews that I did at Richard Wood's Lead Gen Summit back in October. I speak to seven business owners at different stages of their business journey and ask them what they have found most challenging about starting up their own business. Their experiences in business range from people just beginning to somebody who's been established for for 20 years. And it's really interesting to hear what they have to say in their different perspectives on, on what they individually have found challenging. I also managed to catch up with two of the amazing speakers, Jordan Bucknell and Daniel Priestley, and ask them for advice on how to generate leads if you have either a very small or perhaps even no real budget at all. And they give a couple of great tips for us. There were lots of people there, so you will definitely feel and hear the buzz of chatter in the background. We're going to start off with Jake Liddell. Jake is the lead gen ninja, and in his talk, he begins by telling us about what the sales world used to be like before he goes on to tell us what we should be thinking about now. So let's go ahead and hear what Jake has to say. So to me, it's about people, lead generation. Because in the old days, it used to be that we try and grab somebody and we try to sell to them. If you think about the classic uh, double blazing salesperson, their first job was to get through the door. And their second job was to stay in the house until you bought something. Um, a, a car salesman, the first job was to get you to the local dealership and then keep you there and keep buying you with coffees and test drives and all that kind of stuff until you bought the car. Very much a sales process. And you used to have books coming out about how to close, how to close people. But that's not the world that we live in anymore. Often, these days, a car buyer knows more about the particular model of car than the sales does. Are really worried about sales. It can be the biggest bugbear of any new business, figuring out that way to to make a sale, and yet we don't want to be seen as a salesperson. And I wonder how much of that resistance is down to the stereotypes that Jake is talking about, and maybe our own bad experiences as well. We forget the good experiences that we've had because they didn't really feel like we were in a sales process. But those poor experiences stick in our minds. Jake's talk was obviously a lot more than the excerpt that I've shown here um, and was a really interesting talk about lead generation. But the last bit of his talk, which was still in the introduction that I want to share with you, is just what he says about lead generation. And so what we're talking about today is very much lead generation. But to me, it's about people. It's about telling your message to people and trying to tell it to as many people as you possibly can. It's all about people. I love that. It's easy to forget the person. We get so caught up in our fear of selling that we forget that what we're really trying to do is to make a difference to the person that we're speaking to. I believe, and I do truly believe this, that most of us aren't out there just to make a sale to get money into our pockets, that we believe that what we're we're selling or that we're, we're offering to somebody is really a value and is really going to give them something that they need. And that if we can remember that, if that can underlie all of the conversations that we have, that we can think about how we're helping that person, that that might help to change our perspective as we start to generate leads. And now let's move on to the first of our mini interviews. In this little snippet, I'm talking to Alana Farquhar. And Alana is at the very start of her journey. Let's hear what Alana is finding challenging at this stage of her new business. Hello, so I'm now here with Alana Farka, um, who's again at the Lead Gen Summit. And Alana, I just wanted to find out, I know you're just starting up your business, to really just understand a little bit about what has been the most challenging thing so far. 
I think it's been clarifying my idea. So it's kind of, I know what my strengths are and I know what I can offer people, but it's it's how do I put that in a concise, you know, this is what you get and this is what you pay and this is what we'll do. So for me at the moment, I mean, I've, I'm pretty much there, but I, it has been a challenge over the last few months to to get that clear. <laughs> it is interesting, isn't it? Because it kind of, you've got this nugget of an idea mm. and then when you start telling people and you can either see that their faces going blank or, or you think, I've just talked for 20 minutes and they still don't know what I meant. They, yeah. And you've got to evolve through it to get yeah. to that point. And I've had a lot of positive response. So on oh, the face fantastic. of it, the idea has, has been well received. But then when I start to think, oh, okay, so what if I actually get people asking me for my service? What does that entail? You know, so it's all well and good to say, oh, I, I can do this, that, and the next thing. So, um, but it's going in the right direction. So Excellent. that's good. Oh, that's really good. I look forward to hearing how it's progressed. Yeah, that's hopefully, it. yeah. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. Thanks for asking me. The idea was for Putting your offer together and knowing exactly what it entails is so important. And it can catch you by surprise because often in our head, we think we know what we're offering and we think that we're really clear. And it's only when we go to explain it to somebody else that we realize that we're not. So spending some time, as Alana is doing, to make sure that you are clear and that you can explain it to somebody else is really valuable. However, as my next guest, Mandy Dinely from My Beautiful Pen mentions, even when you have an offer, things can be shifting and evolving all of the time. And sometimes that happens even more quickly than we expect. Mandy is a bit further down the path with her new business and is already a successful business owner with Stella and Dot. She shares some of the challenges that she's found as she's starting My Beautiful Pen. So back again with yet another person from the Lead Gen Summit, and this time it's Mandy Dinely. And Mandy is the owner and founder of My Beautiful Pen, which just makes me want to go out and buy pens, I have to say. <laughs> Hi, Mandy. How are you? Hello. I'm good. Thanks, Deborah. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very good. much. Yes. Um, Mandy, I just wanted to, you've started um, My Beautiful Pen, you know, a couple months ago, a few months now. Yeah. And so it's obviously in early stages, but I was just wondering if you could share some of the key challenges that you found you know in that startup process yes I mean the name finding the name was fairly easy so that that was the easiest thing I would say but then what I have found the most difficult I would say with a new business is the funding of it to be that's a real struggle because when you're not earning money because you're setting up a new business um, and you don't have funds elsewhere that you can that you can draw on or you can't you know you can't keep taking lots of money from another area to put into it. I think that is the main struggle, the funding. So that can slow the whole process down, I would say. Um, if you know, setting it up, marketing, all those sort of things, buying, you know, some of the products that I want to add on to my beautiful pen, I can't get at the moment, so I have to be patient. So it's kind of exercising some patience and then yeah. looking at, okay, well, here's the funding I have, here's how it's going to yes. have to basically play out as I try and move it forward. Yes, but, yeah. yeah, and it, it's very frustrating because obviously I'm, in, you know, I'm, I'm pretty impatient. I want it to. Yes, I want it to go and, and I want to run with it. But that's one of the um, struggles. And also, I would say technology, if you're not... You know, I'm okay with technology, but I would say that, you know, it can be very frustrating when you're, you're having to do everything yourself. And again, you know, it, it's hard to get it all to work. And, and it's so many learning curves to go up. And it yeah. is that, that question of at what point do I say, well, the money that I do have... I'm going to spend on somebody else doing it versus actually know that money is better spent elsewhere. Therefore, I'm going to have to persevere with this learning curve. It's yes. really difficult, isn't it? It's good. Yeah, it is. I think it's good for me because it it's really stretches me and it also makes me a little bit more organized, I would say. Um, yeah, and, and it's also what I have found interesting setting up the business is how it's evolved and how it's actually changing already. Wow. So with the initial idea, which is still there, it's it's changing and it's developing all the time, which is oh. exciting. Yeah, that's really exciting. And I look As Mandy mentions, funding can be a challenge and making the decisions on what to spend your pot of money, particularly if it's a small pot of money on, 
is really difficult and you've got to weigh up the benefits of what will happen if you don't spend it, what will happen if you do spend it, um, and figure out what works best for you and your fledgling business. One of our speakers, Jordan Bucknell from the Upbeat Agency, was talking about Facebook and Instagram. So after his talk, I asked Jordan for some suggestions on generating leads for those on a low or non-existent budget. He had some really great suggestions. So here, have a listen. Hello, I'm here with Jordan Bucknell from Upbeat Agency. Hello. He's just given a presentation at the Lead Gen Summit. Um, Jordan, your focus is all on Facebook and Instagram ads, and it would be really great if you could share just what somebody who's maybe starting out, doesn't have a lot of budget to, to put towards it, what they could maybe try themselves to just get moving. Cool. Um, there's a number of different things. I would say if they're just starting out, let's suppose they've built themselves a website and they want to get themselves going. The first thing I would say is when you build an ad account, Facebook will give you what's called the Facebook Pixel, which is basically a snippet of code that you can put on your website, similar to like a Google Analytics snippet of code. And that will allow you to track and understand the people that come to your website. So if I come to your website and I look at a product page, you can then build an audience of people that have been on that product page and then choose to show them ads. Yeah. Okay. I would I would say that because what we can do there is something that's called always on activity, which means that you should always have that remarketing add on, but it requires that pixel in place to have it. It's, the pixel is free, yeah, so it doesn't right. cost anything. Um, and if you have a small amount of traffic, which you probably do when you're starting out, um, then of course your ad spend is going to be very low. You okay. Know, a few pounds a day. Yeah. So therefore, is, you can actually have a big impact uh, because the people that are going to see the ad are going to be very relevant. So Facebook Pixel, one of the one that I would say is um, you have the ability with your iPhone to create videos. So therefore, my advice would be uh, video creation using your iPhone on you know things that you're passionate about with regards to your business, which you can share and turn into ads. Therefore, you have content creation at your fingertips. Excellent. That is wonderful. Great ideas from Jordan and really easy to put into action, but equally easy to put off doing. Someone who has been creating lots of videos is Lindsay Milner. Back in June, Lindsay set herself a 30-day challenge to do a Facebook Live every day, reviewing a book in two minutes. She did it. I was really impressed. It didn't matter where she was. She was there at the appropriate time recording her review of the books. So what this means is that she's now got a body of content that's there and available for her to use. Since June, she's continued with her videos, but she's realized that two minutes was maybe a little bit short. So they're now a book in five minutes and they're released weekly on YouTube. Her business, Silver and Training, is still young and Lindsay shares some of the challenging aspects of being a solo business Hello, owner. So I'm at the Lead Gen Summit and I've just been joined by Lindsay Milner. And Lindsay, you're from Silver and Training, is that right? Hi Deborah. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So I know that you are still fairly, you know, sort of new and fresh into business. And what I'd really like to know is just what have you found so far the most challenging aspect of starting your own business? The most challenging aspect, I think for me, probably the most challenging thing is knowing where to focus my efforts, what is the thing that is going to make the best use of my time, because I feel like I'm trying to learn a lot about a lot of new techniques, I mean we've just heard some stuff about Google Analytics, and, and I'm pretty sure I tried to install that, but got stuck with the, the tech, so yeah, I think it's trying to keep motivating myself to learn new things, a lot of the time alone and you haven't got easy access to support to work out how to do that, that kind of thing. And, and do, you, do you feel that you are making progress with that or is it an ongoing sort of battle to try and say, okay, you know, everybody's giving me the latest information, do I drop what I was doing and charge ahead with that one or, it, or is it getting easier as you go along? Yeah, I think it does start to get easier because you start to work out what works and what doesn't work and then you start making some decisions and, and again, probably another challenge that I personally face is, you know, I'm a, a world-class procrastinator, so it's very difficult to sort of motivate yourself when you are alone, but what I've done is I've started using a few new techniques 
um, and getting support from people who are in a similar position as me, um, like, like you, <laughs> and also kind of working out, you know, okay, I could do, you know, spending a bit of time, taking time out to look at, okay, I could do this, this, this and this, which one shall I focus on? So I, I think I've made quite good progress in learning how to focus my own attention. Um, and I think that's been really useful. That's really wonderful. And I know that I've seen in our conversations just some of the progress that you're making now as you're trying out some of those new techniques. So Yeah, um, I, think, I think that's the thing. Is you do try out new techniques and then you have to step back and review, is this technique actually working for me or not? And yeah, I, I feel quite good at the moment that I've found a few things that are working pretty well. Yeah, that is great. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Okay, thanks, Deborah. As Lindsay says, knowing where to focus your efforts is a challenge, and it's something that many of us find difficult. There are so many things that we can do, but knowing what is going to serve us best is really hard. And as a result, we sometimes work on what feels best at that moment in time, rather than on the things that are really going to serve us well in the future. Daniel Priestley from Dent Global gave a talk on data-led lead generation during the summit, and it was really interesting to see how they are using scorecards to shape the conversations they have with potential clients. I realized that having the data may just help you to know exactly where to focus your energies. After his talk, I asked Daniel about other ways of gathering data if you're not in a position to have a scorecard developed for you. Here's Hi, I'm here with Daniel Priestley, who's just given a great talk on data and scorecards at the Lead Gen Summit. Hi, Daniel. How are you? Hey, thanks for having me on your show. Oh, no problems at all. Um, Daniel, just thought I would ask you quickly. So for somebody who's looking at how they can get leads in and wondering about scorecards and that, but maybe aren't at that point, I guess, financially to be able to progress it, what would be a good way for them to get started? Uh, a couple of things. There's a really cool old uh, piece of technology called a clipboard and a piece of paper. <laughs> and I'm a big fan of clipboarding. So even when I talk to funded startups um, who have got huge budgets, I often send them out on the street with a clipboard or out to their market with a clipboard to just ask questions eyeball to eyeball and find out insights um, about you know their market. Um, so that's a great place to start. There's also free stuff online, so Google Sheets, Google Docs, um, there's Typeform, um, all of these allow you to survey markets, um, survey monkey. Um, so yeah, basically Collect more data, collect more insights. Um, don't pretend that you know everything about every client. Um, the more people you go out and ask for information, the more you discover uh, what is driving your customer. That is excellent, so thank you very much. My pleasure. Getting out there with a clipboard is scary stuff, but having seen the value of data as Daniel has described it, it may well be worth overcoming your fear to do it. That is, if you know where to find your prospective clients. If not, then using some of the other tools that Daniel has mentioned and putting surveys out on Facebook and your web page are great ways to connect with prospects. Speaking of websites, my next guest is Jess Staniforth of Purple Spider Digital. Jess has always been involved in the realm of marketing, but she's just started her new business and is focused on web development and helping others to know where they need to focus their time and energy. She shares some of her biggest challenges with us. Hello, I've got Jess Staniforth with me. We've just finished the Lead Gen Summit. Um, Jess is from the Purple Spider Digital. I am. Um, how are you today, Jess? I'm very well, actually. Yeah, I had a really good day. Excellent. So did I, and it was great sharing a table with you, even though we didn't seem to manage to talk very much. It was. It's nice to see a few familiar faces, though, when you do things like this. It just yeah, makes you a bit more comfortable. It does, doesn't it? So. so, Jess, I know that Purple Spider Digital is actually a fairly new change in direction for you. Um, so it'd be great just to hear what, what some of the key challenges or a key challenge that you found in doing so. So yes, it is a bit of a, a change. It's all kind of gone around a, a marketing, but now I'm focusing more on, um, on web development and really helping people to take advantage of everything that can be done um, around their website. Um, and I think the biggest challenge I've ever faced is definitely going to have to be the time one. I think it's a most common for so many people 
the challenge of time um, and it's, it's what I'm trying to help other people to do and to prioritise and then likewise I'm making myself do it as well. Which is great if you can make yourself do it and are you finding that that's working? Are you able to apply the techniques to yourself or is it still a challenge? It's definitely more of a challenge to do it to yourself. It's obviously much easier to manage other people oh, and to is. tell them actually if you've only got three hours that's fine, this is your priority and get on with it. Uh, when it's yourself it is harder but I found one of the best uh, ways to, that I've managed it is actually just making sure I record my time. Okay. So really, and it's something that actually I've been really bad at before, and it's yeah. just a simple, you know, just use any app and just literally record how much time I'm spending on things, has allowed me to be much more realistic as well in what I'm doing every day. Okay, oh that's excellent. It's a really good bit of advice. Yeah. Thank you very much. Time is a huge challenge for most small business owners, and I have found that most people put too much on their to-do list. And this means that they're unlikely to get through that list, which can result in you putting even more pressure on yourself and then ending up in, in feeling overwhelmed because there's so much to do and you never seem to be making any progress. Doing as Jess has done and tracking how long it really takes for you to achieve something can make a huge difference because then when you're planning what you're going to do on a particular day or in a week, you're much more realistic about what you can get through. And that leads you to feeling more successful, feeling more positive, and actually getting through the things on your list. And this is really useful when you're feeling that you've got to do it all, that everything in your business is sitting on your shoulders, as my next guest, Jade Binstead of Ribbons Media talks about. Hello, so I've got Jade Binstead here with me of Ribbons Media. Hi, Jade. Hi. It's really nice to meet you, and yeah, I know really we're nice to meet you. trying to put our names to faces and thinking we know each other, but we can't figure out where from. <laughs> so, Jade, in your business, what is one of the things that you found most challenging when you were starting up? Oh, quite a few things, but I think actually when I was starting up and still actually ongoing it's the doing everything thing so obviously running a video production company I am quite good at marketing and I enjoy marketing and I love that side of things but it doesn't necessarily that mean I've got time to do my own stuff so actually from the beginning and even now it's balancing the working on the business and working in the business time and actually allowing myself to take out time to work on the business yeah, which is really hard, isn't it? Because we're so focused on in it that actually going, no, this time is going to lead me to more work. It's going to lead to that, yeah. you know, while well, leads coming in is yeah. difficult. And so did you find when you were sort of trying to do the marketing things for yourself, did you find that there was a learning curve for doing it for your own business or was it just the time challenge for you? Oh, definitely a learning curve. So I've spoken about here today about doing the um, blueprint training. So I've done all the blueprint training for myself, but again, that was having to be really strict with myself because it takes a lot of time it, oh, it does. to take that time and to do it but now I feel well equipped to do it and I can even you know advise a little bit with clients what to do with their videos but yeah I mean it is a challenge and again being um, strict to do my own and not reply to an email when I see it come up know that that's important too. Yeah, it's making sure, that, as you say, that you've got that, that, you know, yes, this is equally important and therefore my focus, it deserves my focus. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. That's okay. This is a theme that appears over and over again. To get the work, you need to work on the business. Once you've got the work, you need to work in the business. If you don't manage to find a balance, this can lead to a boom or bust or roller coaster ride. When you've got the work on, you're feeling great, you're making money, you're you know working with clients, and then it finishes, and now you're into the bust where you're just worrying, where's the next bit of money going to come from, and you've got to start the marketing again, and you go through this cycle over and over again, unless you can find a way to keep everything running on a much more level pegging. For someone like my next guest, Carolyn Evans, this is even more important because Carolyn fixes her clients. She's a hypnotherapist, and this means that when she's solved whatever they've come to see her about, they go away, which is absolutely wonderful because it means she's really good at her job. But from the other angle, it means that she's really got to keep on top of her marketing to keep that flow of new customers coming in. 
Carolyn and I were, unfortunately, trying to talk just as Richard Woods is calling everyone back in from the break to start again. We did our best to continue, but you will hear Richard um, as he's calling everybody back in. Uh, we do laugh about it a little bit in the middle, as every time we went to speak, he seemed to speak at the same time. It was perfect timing. Um, but I think that you'll get the message from Caroline anyway. So let's hear from Caroline Evans of Caroline Evans Hypnotherapy. Hello, so I'm here with Caroline Evans of Caroline Evans Hypnotherapy. Um, Caroline, it's really nice of you to take a few minutes. Thank you. No problem at all. My pleasure. My pleasure. Um, so Caroline, I'm just really talking to people to find out what they found most challenging when they were starting up their business, and I wondered if you could share. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, when I was starting up my business, because I'm a hypnotherapist, so um, I guess the, the most challenging thing was um, I was so keen and ready to help people in what I knew and what I had studied and it was really finding those clients and getting them to know where I am to come and see me. So it was really growing my, um, finding my target uh, market and being able to know how to, how to access them and, and one, what one, marketing one, channels one, would be. One. As you can hear, we're starting. <laughs> um, so, and do you find that still a challenge? So, now that you've known how to access your market a bit more, is it then all going to be We'll wait for a second. <laughs> It is an ongoing challenge simply because of the nature of my business. Uh, once I have my clients and then I see them for a lengthy period, then I don't see them again because they get fixed. So, Which is a nice right. situation. Right. So, it's, it's successful in recording. We're starting now and but I'm, I'm sure everybody that's 4.30 uh, will all be in the bar. Ish. Hoping. <laughs> <laughs> on, yeah. on missing traffic, depends where you're going with it. So I ha it's an ongoing problem. On all of a sudden to find. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so I'll really, okay. <laughs> I'm always looking for new business, so I'm okay, so I'm, I'm delighted to be able to uh, um, just to take continue some cycle. Part yeah, of this so I, I have to rely um, on referrals. We, we yeah, really keep talked my about a number of things that are around on, on the ball all the time, which is why this conference has been so it's 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 great. It's really all about lead generation for me. Yeah, that is lovely. Thank you. And as we can see, keeping on top of marketing all the time is really important, and finding ways to achieve this can feel hard. My next guest, Chris Brown of the Horizon Group, shares how he and his fellow business owner made the most of their existing network to assist with that marketing and to get a bit of a head start. Hello, so I've got Chris Brown with me. Chris is of the Horizon Group. Hi, Chris. Hello. Thank you for taking a few minutes to talk to me. We're still at the Lead Gen Summit, so just taking a little bit of a break at the moment. So, Chris, in your business, what kind of challenges did you find, you know, especially when you were first starting it up? Are there anything that kind of sticks really clearly in your memory? Absolutely. Um, when we first started, we were use, I started a business with a business partner, and we were both had sort of uh, profiles and had networks in our niche, but we very much were keen to um, we were keen to work out how to use our existing network and you know monetize that essentially uh, and use the goodwill that we'd built up in that network to um, bring in leads for us. Um, it's very difficult to set up a business and create a website and then hope that people magically find your website and magically then want to do business with you. You need to have a bit of a head start. You need to um, use people who can maybe provide SEO work or provide some sort of marketing work to give yourself a bit of noise because just creating a business card, just creating a, a website isn't going to be enough. And so the way we did it was try to go out to our network and try and sort of uh, build up momentum and noise through that to bring in our first leads which then sort of in theory and, and as we've seen it does escalate and therefore it snowballs and you, yeah. know, you hope that if you do a good job for one person uh, then you'll be referred by them yeah, that it start, as you say, it starts to snowball yeah. based on that, that recommendation. So did you find, because I know you said you've got a number of different businesses, yes. did you find that you were able to kind of leverage that, that network from, from maybe the first business in the other ones as well, or is it kind of starting no, from scratch again? No, very much it's uh, using the, the same 
suppliers, the same contractors, the same people in the network on the other businesses because I'm very much uh, staying in my field. And so the businesses, despite being very separate entities, they are very much in hand with each other. Right. Um, and it's just been a natural evolution. Uh, and it's also been just through opportunities of meeting different people. Right. Uh, and working together well. Yeah, and doing things like this as well, where you meet lots of different people Absolutely. as well. Makes a difference, doesn't it? So that was wonderful. Thank you very much. No problem. Okay. Having started this off with Alana, who was in the very early days of her business, I'm finishing up with Richard Dwyer of Flair Gymnastics and Kids Impact. Richard has been running his business for 20 years, so we've really covered the full spectrum of startup to established and growing business. Let's hear what Richard has to say about his experience of setting up a business, establishing a team, while also developing a successful career in a completely different area. Hello, so I'm still at the Lead Gen Summit and I've got Richard Dwyer sitting down with me. Hi, Richard. Hi. So tell me about your companies, please. So I've got um, a company called Flair Gymnastics, which is a kids' gymnastic school company. We've got five sites. I've also got a um, kids' fitness company called Kids Impact. So we, uh, we deal with lots of parents and children in our business. And are you dealing with them directly or do you franchise out the, the different... Um facilities? Originally directly, so we set up in 1998, so we're in our 20th year with the gymnastic schools. We've now got five sites, one of those is a franchise, so we recently franchised the okay. model. And we went from yeah, 20 kids in a sports hall through to about 3,500 members that we have now wow. across five sites and a big school outreach project that we do. Oh, that's fantastic. So do you remember, if you look back, you know, 20 years ago. <laughs> Do you remember any of the challenges and things that you faced when you were first starting up? Oh yeah, my battle scars, absolutely. <laughs> I think the biggest challenge, um, or initially setting up, we set up with no money, no investment, nothing. I think it's a big myth that you need money to create a, a new business. You just need an idea and some grit, determination, and a bit of confidence um, to make it happen. Um, so we got set up. Um, as we grew, I needed staff. So I needed to build a team. Now, I was hugely fortunate that during the setup of my gymnastic schools, I was also training to become a stuntman for TV and film. As you do. As you do. <laughs> and because my background was gymnastics, did a bit of acting as a kid, a bit of, bit of uh, theatre and TV, and I wanted to become a stuntman. So I trained to become a, a TV and film registered stunt performer, and my career took off at the same time as my gymnastic schools were starting up. So I had to learn very early to delegate. And that was the key lesson for me, was to be able to build a team and delegate um, whilst growing that team so that I could step out and work on the business and not work in the business. I think that was my biggest learn at the beginning was how to delegate, how to build systems so the team could, build, could run the system so that I wasn't people dependent but system dependent. And that is coming up to now 20 years in that, in, in, in that business. It's still, I think staffing is still the, the biggest, uh, can be the biggest problem if we're talking like business problems, um, but it, they're your biggest asset. Your staff, your team are your biggest asset. So it's, it's continued training, training your team so well um, that they don't want to leave. Well enough that they can leave, but train them and treat them well enough that they don't want to leave. And that, that's the biggest learn is really being able to train the team to run the systems and delegate. And do you find that you've got essentially because of that experience where you, you really, if you wanted to do both of them, you, you had to learn to delegate because obviously you couldn't delegate the stunt bit. <laughs> nice as it might have been. Um, a stunt double for a stunt double. <laughs> that's yeah. right. I'm just sending in my stunt that's double a, that's today. A, that's a business idea. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Uh, I think they soon cut out the middleman. Maybe. <laughs> um, but did you find that as a result, you ended up with a company culture that was about enabling your employees to, to do things rather than it being a controlling culture where you needed to oversee everything specifically? So, so do yeah, you think that good shaped question. the... I think from the beginning... Um, like, you know, a culture in a company is created either by design or by default as a culture, whether you like it or not. Exactly. We, 
we had to very carefully craft our culture, but I really only learned this stuff probably six years in. So I really learned business through doing business. And it was probably only six years in when I looked at our company and went, right, we, we need to actually culture by design. Um, so establishing our values, creating a culture that's right, putting everybody on the same vision, the same mission, everybody on the same page, our common purpose. So that was when probably six years in when we invested a lot more in training and systems and recognized that we had to have the culture right and that we had to teach the culture. We had to teach that through the standards um, that we... I mean, one of the speakers that was on from the council earlier on, David, David. Um, Rushmore Borough Council, made a very good point. So Gulfstream are now in at Farnborough, which is awesome for, for, for business in Farnborough. Gulfstream being one of the biggest aviation manufacturers and maintenance companies, I think, globally for private aviation. And his his biggie when they were in discussions with um, Gulfstream was that Gulfstream are very, very uh, interested in the partnership with TAG, who are their sort of the hub, uh, who own the airport at Farnborough, mm -hmm. and TAG's high standards. I think it's only until we, we raise our standards as a human being that we can then echo that into our team and our team can, to, can, can have high standards and we hold people accountable to those standards. You know, this is how we do it here. These are our standards. And I think that's the, that's the difference between a successful business and a non-successful business is the owner has high standards and make sure that echoes across, the, uh, across his company, his or her company. His or her company, Absolutely. of course. That is really wonderful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You may think that having staff and defining a business culture is something that's a long way off for you. But I think it's something that you start establishing early on with how you treat yourself, your suppliers, and your clients. You may not be aware of it, but it's there. As Richard said, one way or another, your business will have a culture, and if you really want it to reflect what your values are, you need to work on it. Starting with delegating, maintaining high standards, and giving people the skills to leave, but the environment that means they don't want to leave, sounds absolutely amazing to me. So... My fellow business owners have shared a lot of great experience and advice, reminding us of the many challenges that we as business owners face. The great thing to realize is that you're not alone. No matter how you're feeling at times, no matter how sometimes you're on a high, sometimes you're on a low, and occasionally you're on that nice even keel in the middle, everybody else has been there, could be there right now, and is going through the same things. We all face challenges no matter what stage of the business that we're in at the moment. I'll be back next week in conversation with Dane Shuda. Dane runs a company in the U.S. providing ghost blog writing services and has a really interesting story to tell about how it came to be and the challenges that he faced along the way. I'll talk to you then. Have you thought about having your own podcast? I offer a podcast launcher service, and this is there to help you to figure out what your podcast could be about, who you're talking to, why you're doing it, and then to get the podcast up and running as quickly as possible. If you'd like to know more, go to bridgeroadconsultants.com forward slash podcast hyphen launcher. The link will be in the notes. Bridging Gaps, the business podcast, was produced by Deborah Levitt of Bridge Road Consultants Limited, with original music provided by Pete Dinley. You've been listening to Deborah Levitt on Bridging Gaps, the business podcast.